Okay, I would like to say hello and welcome to our audience, which will be growing as I speak. I'm going to start by introducing myself. My name is Catherine Reed and I am an art therapist. I'm also the manager of the Creative Arts Therapy Program at Children's Hospital Colorado. I am so excited to kick off our monthly presentation in our series, Enhancing Wellness for Healthcare Professionals Through Engagement with the Arts. So today is our first of uh, 12 presentations throughout 2021. And I wanna give you a little context for this series before we begin today. So I am a member of the CORAL research team and we are a multidisciplinary research group dedicated to studying the effects of creative arts therapy interventions on the development of resilience and the reduction of burnout in healthcare professionals. We are funded by the National Endowment of the Arts and our mission includes community education in building awareness, but also building bridges between the creative sectors and uh, the healthcare sectors of our community. So our charge from the NEA, the National Endowment of the Arts, is to establish an arts and healthcare community in Denver and to serve as a broader resource. As one of about 24 national research labs, we are the only one in Colorado. We are proud to be the first funded NEA lab in Colorado and on Anschutz Medical Campus. And we are breaking new ground in creative pathways toward resilience. So today I am super proud and excited to introduce our very first speaker. Her name is Tara Rinders, RN, MFA, BSN are her letters. She is the founder and creator of The Clinic. And this is an original concept that is garnering national attention. And I will let her continue that introduction and take us on our way. We are going to be um, listening to Tara for about the first 40 minutes of our presentation. And during that time, if you develop questions, um, please include them in our question and answer section, not in our chat form. And then at the end of her presentation, we will, I will be uh, moderating the questions and Tara will answer as many as we can have time for. All right, on that note, Tara, take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Catherine. And um, thank you, everyone. I wish I could see all your faces, but um, I'll just know that you're out there. And thank you so much. I first, I really want to thank the Coral team for their camaraderie and their support and mentorship in my path and the research I'm doing, specifically Dr. Mark Moss and you, Catherine, for coming alongside this work. Um, uh, with the arts with healthcare providers. So, so thank you so much and thanks for having me. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and get started. So as Catherine said, I am the artistic director of the clinic. The clinic is an immersive theater um, company that creates site specific performances inside hospitals and other locations that raises awareness of compassion fatigue burnout, as well as workshops for nurses and healthcare providers. I'm also a nurse, and I've been a nurse for over 16 years. I've worked in the emergency room, um, in the infusion center, and medical surge. I've basically done everything, critical care, and um, also a nurse educator. These are the co-directors of the clinic. Leah Bonfilio, she's based out of New York, Claire Hamor out of Denver, and Jad Tink out of Lebanon. And so behind any in, behind any project, it has many arms and legs and minds, and these three have really been huge supporters as co-directors of the clinic. I also want to say that as a nurse, I'm also, I also have my master's in dance, so I'm a dancer, and I've been a dancer my whole life, and that really is pr probably my primary language. So if I could do this all through interpretive dance today, I would. I'd like to start with a, just a couple stories of my background. And um, I'm already feeling a little bit, um, I'm feeling emotions right now. I'm feeling a little sadness. So I'm gonna just be honest about that as I share some of the background that really has been the reason why I do this work and the reason um, behind um, why the arts have been so important to me in my life as well as, um, as a nurse. So you could see in the middle is my beautiful mother and she passed away when I was 26 and she was 49 and left behind her four children, myself being the oldest. Um, you can see myself and my sister who's in a wheelchair and my other sister and then the, um, is my niece on the far um, left there. And then my brother's right below me 
And then that's, that's me on the other side with my twins who are now five years old. So these pictures and this background is all here to share. Um, after I lost my mother, I was, a I was a nurse and had been working full time for many years. And I took some time off to care for her. And we spent um, you know, two years doing chemotherapy and um, battling her cancer. We moved to Houston to go to MD Anderson. And when she passed away, it was really um, a moment for me to find my resiliency again and find what gave me pleasure. And that's when I went back to dance. And um, even though I had been dancing throughout all of that, um, my career as a nurse, I decided to get my master's. And that's when I went back to dance. And my last year of my master's, my sister, who you'll see um, in the wheelchair, had something called acute disseminating encephalomyelitis where she went from a, a completely normal 26 year old into, um, into a coma and was in a coma for many months. And I, I moved into her rehabilitation room with her. And, um, and again, our mother had passed. So I was in that caregiving mother role and I was her voice to the doctors. I um, was her advocate. I bathed her, I fed her once she didn't need a feeding tube. And, um, and I spent many moments in really deep um, sadness with her as she would wake and realize what had happened to her body. And um, at night I would dance in her room and I found this um, really interesting bringing together of such intense sadness and tragedy alongside some of really in intimate, beautiful moments that I had with my sister. And that became the basis of what um, a lot of my art is based upon is that experience. And you'll see at the bottom, my brother, he um, shortly after my mother passed was diagnosed with schizophrenia and spent a lot of time in and out um, of the hospital as well as jail. And when he was 30, he was um, in jail and was very, and was septic and was brought to the hospital and told the doctors he didn't want to live anymore. And none of us knew he was in the hospital and, the, um, and he was able to make that decision despite his mental capacity. And so he passed away at 30 um, alone and we didn't know. And so it, that's brought a new element into my work of how fatigue and burnout can lead to some of these health disparities, um, not only with people inside our, our prison system, but also um, our um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color and the different treatment that they are receiving in the hospital. So I don't really think I need this slide because I think we know why we as healthcare providers need um, care and that we are burnt out. And this is from 2017. So you can only imagine how much more um, we need now during COVID and um, for years and years and years to come. And this is showing some of the health disparities, just focusing on, on, on um, black maternal deaths, uh, four to one based. Um, and, and again, I'm starting to bridge this um, new understanding of how does our burnout, how does my role as a nurse um, impact um, health disparities and what's my role in racism at the bedside um, as a nurse and whose voices am I empowering? So I'd like to jump now into the arts. This is the, our most recent creation called Resiliency Moments. And this was created um, during COVID when we had to pivot our work. And it's all virtual, it's all online. And it includes one artist and one healthcare provider at a time. They all come online and there's a hostess that greets them and has this um, you know, theatrical and playful uh, experience with them and then they go into breakout rooms and so it's just one artist one healthcare provider and each artist curates these mini 10 minute experiences that are meant to create space for authentic connection where the healthcare provider can really connect with themselves and offer themselves self-compassion um, in the moment. So I'm just going to go through this is Sun Chung she's based out of New York City and I'll play this her resiliency moment transports you to a meditative space where the air is filled with a singing bowl through moments of memory, moments of stillness, and moments of breath. You are guided gently to find a new grounding and new lightness in your body. And then another um, resiliency moment, that resiliency moment just reminded me to slow down and take a breath. So. I'll do that. Um, this is Leah Bonfilio from, from New York City. And she set up, you can see like the curtain that she has that she slowly opens. 
and it's a mini immersive theater experience. She performs with Third Rail Projects in New York and is um, an incredible performer, but she brings together storytelling and gardening. And so the guest witnesses this planting and watering of a lily bulb while listening to a reading from the secret garden. Then they are asked to dedicate the lily's growth to someone or something. And there's some back and forth with the participants. And there's a promise of cultivating this bulb for the participant and tending to it and then sending photos of its progress. Um, so it's coming alongside someone who's wanting to tend and cultivate something in their life. And she's saying, yes, I'm, I'm here with you in this. And I'm at the same time, I'm gonna um, let this lily be a reminder to you of what it is that you're growing and what it is that you need to let go in order for this to, to grow in its place. And so um, a quote, if you look the right way, you can see the whole world is a garden from the secret garden. This is Jad Tank and he's um, based out of Lebanon and, and also Houston, but he's a dancer and he leads um, nurses through gestures and movements that lead um, to a dance in honor of something or someone they have lost. And so he um, will ask about this um, person or pet or thing that has been lost and then together they come up with movements and then they do these movements over and over. And before you know it, you have this dance that they carry with them um, to be able to honor this person or thing. This is Kelly uh, Greenline. She's based out of Nigeria. And so again, what's really interesting and fun about this is to bring artists from all over the world together. Um, this resiliency moment begins with a singing. She's an incredible voice that's created and sung just for you. And it's a moment to sit and receive. And it involves into thinking about how nature and the healing powers of nature hold us during some of our most difficult moments in life. And then the participant is left swimming in their natural habitat that they talk about, um, elicited by Kelly. And, um, and then she, she ends with more singing that um, hopefully brings them peace as they end their moment again. And lastly, this is Abby. She's from New York City. She's a musician and nurse, uh, or sorry, the musician and the nurse co-create a song together. So she gives them all these different options. Um, they say which one they like best, and she asks them some questions. And then she writes a song in the moment. And remember, this was only 10 minutes um, with them. And um, she sings it for them, records it, and sends it to them. And this is the opening of her moment. Welcome to Choose Your Own Song Adventure. Your journey will begin now. Hello, how are you? Hi. Hi. Good, I'm Abby and I will be your musical tour guide this morning. So that's just a little um, snippet. So upcoming with our resiliency moments is a multi-site research study that we'll be doing with partnering with hopefully up to 30 different hospitals um, through Hospital Corporation of America, assessing resiliency moments impact on self-compassion. Um, and then these resiliency moments will be happening at Denver Health um, in um, the Denver area. It's a whole system that we're opening up to in collaboration with RISE, resiliency and stressful events. Um, and uh, over a three month period to, um, to be able to offer this to over 130 different staff members. So that's you know, how we pivoted during COVID, but I like to go back now into 2017, where we first um, came up with this idea to do First Do No Harm. And so I talked a lot about my family and how they really, um, my experiences as a caregiver for them um, were impetus is to this work, but first do no harm really came out of when my twins were six months old, I had an ectopic pregnancy. And I remember being in the hospital and going through it as a patient for the first time being really a patient in that type of traumatic experience. I've always been on the other end of caring. And I remember um, my fallopian tube burst and I was bleeding internally and they called a code yellow, the, um, the code they call before code blue and I was passed out and I could feel my stomach just getting bigger and bigger. And I could hear everything that was going on. And I um, remember feeling really scared. And I remember my nurse took my hand and she said, um, I'm here and you're gonna be okay. And I just remember thanking her because I was, um, I was so scared and I, and I couldn't speak. And I remember thanking her for remembering me as a person. And that really got me down this road of, we don't realize how powerful and 
integral our roles are as healthcare providers and specifically nurses that we just have, I mean, that moment changed everything for me. I knew that she cared and then I, and I felt hope. And I wanted to help raise awareness of um, compassion fatigue and burnout because it does affect us as patients, but it's affecting our nurses. And if we can care for them first, then, our, then we'll be cared for as patients. So I did a lot of research around burnout and uh, compassion fatigue and thought the best place to start was destigmatizing it and talking about it through performance and art. So I'm gonna just quickly show a, a promo of that. Um, gives you a little idea. So that's a um, little tidbit of all the different scenes. And I'm gonna just walk you through it a little bit more now. This was the opening scene and it, it took place in the main entrance of the hospital. And it was really interesting because they, they agreed to close the main entrance for 15 minutes so that we could perform in this kind of surgery type experience where the audience was looking through the glass and um, they just escorted patients around. Um, it wasn't too far, but I was just really surprised that they would do that for us. So that was, fun. Um, and they, so the audience is watching and we, we do this whole first dance and it's a surgery dance and we have these utensils and the patient comes in um, and there's live music, there's a, a violin and it's so um, the juxtaposition to being in the hospital and hearing the beautiful live music was really palpable. And then we, the, the, there was 30 audience members who came and we break them up into two groups and they get to experience the show, but they get to experience it in different sequences. So when um, this was another performance that took place in this long hallway um, and to really just, this was the hallway that brought us from the main hospital to the physician office building. And um, again, just hitting on this fatigue and burnout with the nurses. This was a monologue that was performed by um, this woman, Megan. She um, was a nurse, um, acting as a nurse and talking about compassion fatigue and burnout and her role of being a mother and caring for um, doing the grocery shopping and, the, and nursing her children and nursing at work and um, all the roles that that and the tolls that that takes. 
This was a really interesting room we found, we found in the basement. So this, a lot of these spaces that we use were, they weren't any patient care areas except one um, that's closed at nighttime to, uh, to patients. But um, we found all these really interesting rooms and this was like a graveyard of beds, of hospital beds. There were just like a hundred hospital beds in this huge room. And so we put this um, red light in and lit it and showed this video and we really start to see um, the breakdown. So this whole performance was told from the perspective of the patient's family, this woman, um, as she's losing her partner and the, the perspective of nurses, um, which was re is really, especially in 2017, something that um, wasn't very heard, those voices. And um, so we're starting to see her start to break down a little bit and start to understand um, the loss that she's about to encounter. And this was death. So death um, was played by Leah Bonfilio and um, she did an incredible job of showing the different dimensions of what death could look like. And um, every time she would pop a balloon is when somebody would, would, would die and um, as part of the, the performance. This is when, so this is the gentleman who um, is dying and you saw in the picture earlier where he was with his partner. She brings him into this conference room and the, all the people there are the guests of, um, of the show. And she lays it out for him of what's happening. So he had a heart attack and a widow maker. So she goes through the pathophysiology of what a widow maker is and basically describes to him why he's dying um, through all these different details. And she um, incorporates the audience in that as well. And then you can see him grappling with this as he's taking up his sheet from his bed. And then the audience members are the ones walking him now to back to his gurney. And then this last monologue is really was really powerful. As you see the wife telling him, you know, you cannot die. We're not finished yet. I know we had some things. We need we it's just, it's, it can't be time yet. And so you watch her grappling with it. Um, and then there's really beautiful live music and it becomes a really emotional moment um, when he does death, does come down the hall, pops a balloon and he ends up leaving. And so this is something as healthcare providers, we see so much this initial um, pain and you see on her face this as an ER nurse and ICU nurses, we've seen in all types of nurses, you've seen this loss, this deep pain, but it was something that was important to show to our, the general public because it elicited emotions in them. And it was like us saying, yeah, we see this every day. We hold this pain and this suffering every day when somebody dies and we keep moving forward. And then we end in the chapel and we end on a light note with this idea that the depth of our grief is also the depths of our joy. So I think back to my family and my loss and the different depths and all the losses we've had collectively and individually, um, when we can be honest about that, uh, of, of what we're feeling around it, we can be honest about our joy as well. So we, ha we had a lot of really, um, um, it was really, recognized, I would say, through um, Newsweek we were recognized in and PBS NewsHour and different media outlets, which was, was really great as far as raising awareness and understanding of this issue. But really it was the testimonials um, from the nurses and from the doctors and the providers who said, um, I, went, I went through, and also just the general public, I went through a slew of emotions and I felt so moved by it all. I cried and laughed and I was guided to release a lot of energetically about hospitals and the industry, about illness and death, about the human psyche, and ultimately about celebrating life and lightheartedness. Then I can't say enough about First You No Harm, Rose Medical Center hosted this event. And as a physician in the ED, I found it profoundly moving. It spoke to the decades I spent witnessing others' grief and captured the compassion fatigue we are all vulnerable to feeling. You owe it to yourself to go experience this. And First Beauty Mohan has brought a new reality to our hospital through um, art and dance, art, very artistic, emotional, powerful performance. I laugh, I cried, I gasped and nodded. The, these emotions continue today as I try to explain to others. Thank you for bringing light to the fatigue that nurses experience as well as the reality of death and life in such a beautiful way. So that really, for me, felt like we did, um, we did our job um, telling the stories that have been untold and having nurses see themselves in this and relating to it and being able to say, yeah, I'm feeling that too. And that's really the first step in de destigmatizing. It's um, 
taking away the shame and the antidote to shame is empathy. So after we raised awareness through this performance, we offered the workshops, some arts and play-based workshops. And I'd like to show you this video. This really gives a good idea of the heart and the spirit um, and the emotions around what happened during our time together. It was over a six week period. I remember not really being able to have the compassion for somebody in their situation that I used to have, that I felt desensitized to their pain and their suffering. And after that, I realized I was tired and I was experiencing compassion fatigue. My name is Tara Reinders. I'm a nurse. I've been a nurse for over 15 years and I'm a dancer and I am the artistic director of the clinic which includes resiliency workshops for nurses and an immersive theater performance that takes place in the hospital setting to raise awareness of compassion fatigue and nursing burnout. The clinic is a six-week workshop series for nurses to combat compassion fatigue and burnout through resiliency training with the arts, music, dance, and performance. It's based in play, so it brings us out of our heads and into our bodies. And just like children, we get curious again and we start thinking about things differently. We start questioning things. We use theater and acting and role playing as a way to address certain really deep and tough questions and issues at hand, but do it through a playful lens. I was surprised at what came out of that and what actually was causing grief that I was holding on to. And it was so great in all the different ways that we visited with the movement and sharing our stories with other nurses who I think when they heard them can really relate and connect. I think just stress lives more in your body than you ever realize. And I think something that happened 50 years ago can be completely in your body. And you know about it. You hear about veterans from war. but you don't really know how it affects a person until you let it out. Some of the worst days feel like they are connected intrinsically to who you are in this profession. That my value as a nurse is how I can take care of people. So on my worst days, does that mean I'm not doing a good job at taking care of people? And it's being able to kind of disconnect those two ideas. So what motivated me for this workshop series is I had an experience as a patient where I almost died and I realized how important nurses are, that they are everything to a patient. And I began researching patient outcomes, patient experiences. I wanted every patient to feel seen and heard and cared for every time. So I realized that compassion fatigue and nursing burnout was stealing the joy that we nurses can receive from caring for another human being, and that there's a huge need for our nurses to be supported and cared for and seen as nurses. The hospital benefits from every employee caring for themselves because when a nurse is caring for him or herself, they're caring for their patients and they are experiencing satisfaction as a nurse. They're empowered to care for others in a healthy way, which decreases turnover, increases patient satisfaction, nursing satisfaction. Ultimately, everyone wins. This is a program for nurses by nurses, and I think that's one of the most important aspects of it is you're being understood, heard, and seen by someone who else who has been through what you've been through and maybe different stories, but the underlying theme is the same. Working with performers has been a totally new experience for me, very outside of the box, and it's been a fun new approach to looking at a serious issue. Identifying that story and finding the ways to move to help you identify how that story really impacted you, you know, emotionally and physically. Didn't even think that story affected me until she said that prompt, and I was like, oh, I remember that. Yeah, after that, I was pretty pissed. And then I was like, wait a minute, I was more than that, you know? Being able to move, my body helped me move through certain pieces of my story that weren't necessarily as comfortable. And seeing other people struggle with the same things I struggled with, it built a little bit of a camaraderie around, you know, everybody who was in the group, that nobody's going through it alone. 
A really important component of this workshop series is the IRB approved nurse-led research study that we're doing and we will continue to do with every workshop series so that we're gathering data to create evidence-based practices that can be used for nurses but also brought to the bedside and used for the care of our patients. So I think the, um, I really just uh, am so grateful for the nurses that went through that. And I, when I watch it, I just brings me back to that time that those pre-COVID times where we could actually touch each other and be close to each other and honor each other in these ways that we haven't been able to now for so long. Um, and I actually just received a text last night from one of those, um, one of the participants and she, um, she just did a, a stint in Arizona on a COVID unit. She's a travel nurse now. And she said, I just wanted to thank you. I've been using so much of the techniques we learned and it's been really overwhelming, but it's helping me. And I just love and miss our community. And that's really what we created was a community of nurses who not just focused on self-care, but we dove right into this idea of collective care. So moved through the individual and collectively we cared for one another. I mean, we are healers, we are nurses, that's what we do. And we um, created space to be able to offer that to one another. And it was really powerful. A lot of the nurses said, you know, I can talk to my partner, I can talk to my therapist, but it's, they don't understand the depth of what I'm going through. Um, and we do as nurses, we understand, and that feels really good. Again, it's um, the antidote is that, is that empathy to shame. One of the participants gave me this quote, nobody escapes being wounded. We are all wounded people, whether physically, emotionally, mentally, or spiritually. The main question is not how can we hide our wounds so we don't have to be embarrassed, but how can we put, it, put our woundedness in the service of others? When our wounds cease to be a source of shame and become a source of healing, we have become wounded healers, Henry Nowen. And that to me really encapsulates encapsul what we did is we um, shared our grief story. So we went through, we used the see me as a person framework, which I'll get into as our theory and um, framework for the workshops. But we got into, um, we wrote our stories and we shared our stories and we created movement to our, our stories. And then we learned each other's stories. We learned each other's movement. So it became again from this individual to the collective. And we realized the power that we um, hold in sharing our vulnerabilities and, um, and the healing that can come from that. We, um, these were our, re our results from the research. We used the ProQual Professional Quality of Life Survey pre and post workshops and um, had some significant, um, not statistically significant, but significant drops in com um, compassion, I'm sorry, burnout and secondary traumatic stress. And um, our our sample size was pretty small. And so I'm hoping when we are able to do these workshops again, we'll be able to compile um, um, more participants and have um, more significant data. So the theories that we use in all of our training, so all of our artists who participate in resiliency moments, as well as the um, workshops, really um, dive into Gene Watson's theory of human caring, the see me as a person framework, and we get we bring in an expert on trauma informed care, and then we also talk about play theory. Uh, play theory. So the the basis of the see me as a person framework is surrounded around authentic connection, and it gives us a language, a common language to be able to use to be able to teach. A lot of times um, we say as nurses, I'm just, it's just my nature. I just I'm a caring person, but you can't really teach that. And um, if it's just innate. But what if we created a language as they did that we can actually use? So authentic connection can be learned, practiced, reflected upon, continually, continuously developed and mastered. It is through presence and attunement that you convey the essential, essential messages in nursing. I see you. I am interested in you. I give you my full attention. I am here. You are safe. Presence is not what you do, but is the way you are. It is a state of being. You cannot connect to another without being present and attuned. And that's what that nurse did to me when I was in um, having my moment of um, when she came alongside me and she said, I'm here and you're going to be okay. She authentically connected with to me in one of the most difficult moments of my life. 
And, um, and I think we forget as nurses and healthcare providers, the power and the weight that we hold and the sacred ground that we stand in and the um, impacts that we have on people, specifically when they're experiencing some of the most difficult times of their life. This breaks it down a little bit more, the framework to attuning, wondering, following, and holding. And just check, checking time here, you can see it's connecting with people exactly where they are. It's a place of curiosity and genuine interest. It's asking questions, um, following where they lead you. So based on your questions, you get a better understanding of who they are without assumption and acting on what you learn from them. And it's creating a safe haven for healing. So this is what we do. This is for nurses. It's a nursing theory, but we use it in our resiliency moments to provide the same care um, and authentic connection to our nurses so they can uh, um, connect with themselves in the moment, see that they're suffering and offer them self-compassion through the arts. And we do it also through play because it, de, uh, it destigmatizes and it takes away fear. So play is an activity while playfulness is an attitude. We create an attitude of playfulness and activity is a coherent and finite set of actions performed for certain purposes, while an attitude is a stance towards an activity, a psychological, physical, and emotional perspective we take on. So during the, um, the workshop, we wrote our grief stories um, using I Remember When, After That I, and um, we created uh, these, this performance. So we took all of our stories, all of our movements and created a performance and we performed it for our colleagues, for the CEO, for the executive team, for nursing leaders, for um, charge nurses and other nursing staff at Rose Medical Center. And these were some of the responses. And again, it goes back to this, Wow, it makes me not feel alone. Um, realizing we all go through tough times, it's very powerful and touching. However, I hate crying first thing in the morning. It did elicit a lot of emotional responses, which I think is always a good thing when we can be honest. And what this is, is I'll go back to this all the time in these workshops and, and in the trainings is we need to be able to tell the truth about how we feel. And until we can be honest and tell the truth, we're not gonna be able to experience healing. And so we create spaces where people can be honest. And um, lastly, I'll show this one last. So um, what was really exciting about the workshops was that the nurses didn't want to stop meeting. Um, like that woman said, we um, continued or, or a year later now, she's saying that I miss and I love our little community. So we continue to meet monthly and she joins us on our um, um, on Zoom now, but uh, we so we meet every month and we created a resiliency um, committee. And part of that during COVID was to um, have moments of it. Okay, I'll read mine. I remember when I first rounded to the departments, I saw so much fear and anxiety and anger in the eyes of the nurses, environmental services, pharmacy. This was the very beginning and we had so many unknowns so many insecurities and our PPE was vanishing. And we were all so worried about dying, about giving our families the virus, giving our children the virus and not being able to take care of our patients. After that, I wanted to do everything I could so our nurses felt seen, heard and cared for so that then our patients would as well. I remember thinking, oh no, we are already at our limits. Our baseline is fatigued and burned out. How are we going to be able to do this and stand? How are we going to be able to continue to care? We're going to need a different name to describe our mental state. Compassion, fatigue, and burnout is just not going to cut it. I remember when I knew not to throw away N95 after each use, but this was the recommendation. And as a leader, I had to share that message with my team even though i didn't agree with it and i was angry because i thought it would put this group of people that i love and care about at great risk when we ran out of after that i started hoarding supplies and lying to my friends and approaching this like it was a war all to make sure that we could take care of patients 
and take care of each other and be safe. And I was angry because the recommendations were coming from people who weren't here with us and they weren't at risk. I remember when I met you. It was the first day we collected PPE in the hospital. There were five cases of COVID in Colorado and the reality of what could uh, come our way was just appearing. You had a cough, but we're happy and hopeful. We admitted you that day, a Friday, and by Tuesday, you were very sick. Um, I remember trying to advocate for you and I remember being scared for myself and my family as I may, that I may have exposed. In the weeks since, I've not stopped wondering about how you're doing, how your family is coping um, as our first COVID-19 patient. Um, since our meeting, I've had the privilege of caring for you in the ICU, cheering your progress, and doing what I can to convey how much we, your healthcare team, your family, and your community want you to pull through stronger and more resilient after this. Maureen Miller, registered nurse. Tara Reinders, registered nurse. I'm Monica Weininger, registered nurse. So during COVID, I felt like it was really important for us to be able to come together um, in safe ways, but to still share our stories and to have that support in the midst of COVID and not wait till after when we thought we could have more time or more availability. So, um, and using movement, which has always been my resiliency and being able to offer that. And um, again, those movements all came from their writings and creating movement for it. And then we all learned each other's movements and decided to um, make it public and share again, um, telling the truth about what we were going through. So next steps, um, really looking forward to partnering with the University of Kentucky and their nursing department and their theater department, Theater Guild of Louisville, to um, create more workshops and more performances. Denver Health um, is going to be hosting the resiliency moments. Um, I'm going to be keynote speaking at um, the Educare Symposium in um, April, as well as um, was received the lectureship for, um, from the Oncology Nurses Foundation for, to speak at their Oncology Nursing Society Virtual Congress. We created a monthly Creative Caregivers, which um, 
well, is all virtual and open to anyone who considers themselves a caregiver. And it's uh, using the arts to provide support and care and bringing in um, different arts-based practitioners to help lead those, and those are monthly. And then I'm working on a performance called A Nurse's Calling, and it's a, it's a one-woman performance um, that I'll be doing, and it's gonna be based out of an ambulance, and we'll be traveling to different locations in the city. And it's talking about our grief collectively and individually, it's talking about our roles and I get specific about my own personal role as a nurse upholding racism and what that looks like and um, getting, um, again, telling the truth around that, as well as the joy that comes from caring from, uh, for others um, and looking for some hope as well in the midst of all of this. So I'll stop sharing. And um, that's all I have, if you would like um, Catherine to take over. So I, I just wanna thank you all so much for um, listening. And um, yeah, I, I hope you're all still there. I, so hard to know if anybody's there, but I, I really appreciate you listening. So thank you. Oh, Tara, um, I am still, honestly, my heart is still beating from that video. What an incredible, um, amount of intensity that the body holds, that the video holds, that the sounds using all our senses and remembering the howls of last spring. Um, that's a beautiful video. So thank you. Um, we are opening up this last 14 minutes to questions and answers. The one question we have so far whew, is from Arena. Saplina, excuse me if I didn't say your name exactly right. I'm going to read this to you, Tara, so you can get a chance to, to hear it and then answer it. Thank you for your success in creating an opening in the system for this work. It is no small feat. I'm a fellow performing artist and work with the power of embodied art practices in relation to illness, health, and healing. I am curious how you see this work functioning in the context of a health system driven by profit and incentivizations that continually subvert processes of care and healing. For example, I know an issue of concern for nurses has been the patient to nurse ratios. I worry about positioning my artistic practice as focused on combating burnout while not shifting the structures of a health system that creates the conditions of burnout. Yeah. Thank you. I think that's such an important question to be constantly considering in all of this. And um, something I, I consider a lot um, is the individual versus the system. And how do we focus and do the work as individuals? And then how do we also um, hold accountable the systems that we're working in um, to also provide a support in that? And I've been thinking a lot around resiliency in that term asking us to, to bounce back quicker, bounce back better without shifting the circumstances that we're asked to bounce back in. And, um, and so I, a, a lot of my work comes back to, again, telling the truth and being honest because once I know what I need, I can ask for it. And there's a lot of spaces um, where people are not able to ask for what they even need, whether it's a 30 minute lunch for a 12 hour shift. It's also recognizing the need, recognizing what you need. So I may, I may there's just still such a disconnect of saying um, when I'm working on the floor, many nurses don't even take lunch breaks because they don't feel like they um, can leave their patients. There's not enough people, it doesn't feel safe. So how do we um, how do we address that? We have to first say I need to, I need to eat. That's my concern. Now how can we put support in for our patients so that that can happen? It's really tricky, but I think the more we empower our nurses and our healthcare providers to speak their truth and to speak of uh, what they need, then we're going to be able to start from within and start making differences. And I do think the arts um, empower us to speak to speak up. So I don't have a great answer and I, I appreciate that question because it's something I'm always considering too. I know it's a question that we've been dealing with uh, every day in our research and our clinical trials as well, Tara, through okay. um, CORAL. Um, so thank you for that really thoughtful answer. You're getting lots of gratitude from Nancy and from Brian, brava. Thank you for sharing your work. Here's thank a question you. from Sharon. Have doctors shown an interest participating in art therapy for their burnout? 
Yeah, absolutely. And that's why we're starting to open this up to um, all healthcare providers. And um, the need right now is so great for everyone, for every single person, whether you're providing care or not right now, we all are just really in need of care, but specifically our healthcare providers on every level. Um, so yes, and one of the doctors um, went to that, the first do no harm performance every single night. She, she was just like, this is telling my story. And so um, doctors are just as much as in need of this than, than um, as nurses as well. It's just, I know it's, the, it's where I'm coming from as a nurse and I know that world, but it is being opened up to others. Yep. And I'll say as an art therapist, I, we're working here at Children's um, doing art therapy with doctors directly with, through virtual processes and our attendance has been tremendous as well as the clinical trials in CORAL. That's so great. Gayla expresses gratitude as well. Here's a question from Mark Moss. He's our principal investigator and a doctor um, at university. He asks, how do you answer the statement from healthcare providers when they say, well, I'm not artistic, so this type of program is not for me? What would you say to that, Tara? Oh, to me? Oh, I thought they were asking. I'm sorry. Well, I'm not artistic, so this type of program is not for me. Well, I go about that many, many ways. Um, I, a lot of times, don't necessarily share the exact artistic process. Like with the workshops, I prepare people, but I don't give them too much um, around the artistic process because I think what's really powerful about it is this idea of disruption and disrupting our normal ways of being. And um, when you disrupt something, disrupt the ways of thinking, you're offering space for them to start thinking differently. And so um, I don't get, I don't divulge too much information. I also believe that when we show these videos, um, these are everyday people doing this work. You, you don't necessarily, are, you're not seeing, you know, um, except for the performance, but in the workshops and in the um, COVID stories, it's just our coworkers. So the more they, um, people are seeing other normal people, quote unquote, unartistic, which I don't necessarily believe is true, but um, ways of moving through this work, they're more apt to do it as well. And I think the emotional part is really important to see people displaying their emotions because people can connect to feeling a certain way. So when somebody's um, sharing their story and emotional about it, they connect to that and, um, and that really helps decrease the fear around it too. I'm a little sneaky is the short answer. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I also, I think a, a lot about um, your quote, the antidote to shame is empathy. Mm -hmm. And I, I think a lot about shame as, as almost a cultural um, endemic of, of Western medicine, right? That we're supposed to be um, upholding this uh, expertise. Mm -hmm. And so any kind of burnout is so hard to talk about because it's admitting vulnerability, which is yeah. in itself um, a difficult thing to admit. And yeah. those our culture allow that honesty and that truth. Yeah. Um, so again, thank you for that beautiful answer. I love the disruption concept as well. Disruption mm -hmm. of our normal kind of ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. um, we have a great question here from May Kumar. Do you see narrative medicine becoming more incorporated with these techniques for both patients and nurses? May, tell me more about narrative medicine. Or if, if you know, Catherine, I'm not sure what that term is regard, what that term so, is. What I know about the, the term, and I don't know if, if, if we're able to bring other voices in. So maybe she might write more. Um, I know that narrative therapy is, is a, it's a, a way of looking at people's stories and re-experiencing uh, their stories so that they can basically rewrite it, right? So experiencing them often for the first time. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a very well-known therapeutic modality that we incorporate in creative arts therapy tremendously. So first understanding your own story so that you can both share it and then reform it and believe it different. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I think that's good to have a term to some of the work that we're doing because that is um, what our grief stories and the COVID stories are really based in is um, creating a safe space for someone to use this prompt. I remember when 
write out their story after that I and how it made them feel. And, um, and then they share their stories. And like one of the participants in the workshop said, I realized that story and that experience affected me, but I didn't realize until I wrote it down how actually, and she used the word pissed off and I was more than that, I really was. And so um, I do think storytelling in narrative medicine is, um, has been very effective and helpful, again, with this um, Me Too idea of um, understanding and saying, yeah, I, I, under I get that. I've, I've experienced that as well. Mm, thank you. Okay, here's a, a question from Nicole, but there's a little bit before the question. So I'm gonna read this to you, Tara. Thank you for such a moving and captivating presentation. My heart is beating too. So much emotion, so much grief, love, and community. Words cannot describe my gratitude for sharing the meaningful work you have done. I am also a fellow artist performer working at a healthcare facility, yet artistic forms are still resisted by many. Looking back at the beginning of your journey as an artist in healthcare, what suggestions could you give? To start with low hanging fruit, like those interested in the art form or applying for grants or legitimizing this work as research? Yeah, I think um, I have a couple answers. First, thank you, Nicole. That was really, um, really kind words. So thank you. Um, I think how I, my journey in this starts at what is your passion? <laughs> and my passion is dance. There's nothing that makes my heart beat stronger than moving my body. And so I bring in every interaction, I have to have had to deal with my own insecurity and let it go and go in 100%. Because if I go in 100% and I'm a little goofy and a little playful, that creates space for others to be like, well, she's kind of not doing it that great either. And she's making it fun. So maybe I'll join with her. Um, so that's one way that I have found, and I get so much pleasure out of it by just playing. So it, it really is um, an authentic experience for me. And people catch on to that when you're passionate about something and you really believe in it. Um, the other thing is I do think the research, legitimizing it through research has been a new, a new thing for me, but so important. And I, part of my next steps is um, hopefully getting my PhD um, in the next year, applying for schools. And so I have found, especially in hospitals who are on the magnet journey, they are supposed to be doing research. And that's something that they, a lot of hospitals struggle in. So um, kind of putting myself in the position to say, I can help you with this through a research study and we can bring the arts in. Um, so it's speaking the language that they speak and understanding what it is that they need. Um, and it may not be arts therapy, they may not need that, but there may be another need you can help meet with and then bring the arts in and sneak it into. I love that. I also, um, I think we're going to close up in just a couple minutes, but I want to say to that, um, Tara, we are establishing a community right here in Denver. And Tara has been really essential um, in bringing light to so much of the potential for the arts and building resilience. And we're also working with our uh, program, Coral, who, who is hosting this lecture series. So Tara, I cannot imagine a better kickoff for mm. our year of speakers. You are a gift to us, mm. to us all. Mm. I just got choked up almost saying that. Oh. Um, I want to thank all of our folks who, who asked questions today. I am guessing, Tara, people might want to reach out to you. Do you want to let them know how to do that before we say goodbye? Yeah, I'll just share this. Um quickly and um, here's um, my at, uh, my website, theclinicperformance.com or you can email me at um, theclinicperformance at gmail.com. And then if you're interested in joining us for any of our monthly caregiver, um, you can um, click on that whoops, as well. So um, I don't know if that's something we can send out, but here it is. I'm not sure the best way to get that to everyone, but yep. Awesome. So um, I do think if anyone wants this in, as a link, um, if you're if you can't copy it here, we can definitely get it to you so you can respond to the folks who sent you this link. So Tara Renders, thank you. Thank you for sharing your story and your your gift with us today. I want to remind everyone that next week, next month, February 19th, will be our second 
presentation from Dr. Amy B. Zielinski. She is the professor and director of the TEACH program at the University of Wisconsin. If you'd like more information on this lecture series, please reach out um, to the folks who sent you the link and we will get you more information. Tara, have a beautiful weekend and thank you again for today. Thanks so much for having me. Take care, everyone. Okay, bye. Bye.